Many researchers believe that the novel coronavirus came from a creature associated with horror stories and haunted houses. We're blaming bats, and we're afraid of them. People tend to be afraid of things that they don't know or are different. Some bats have very funny faces, so I think people are afraid of them because they don't understand them. While it's true that viruses exist in bat colonies, and some may make the leap to human hosts, bats are quite mysterious and very misunderstood. There's so many things we don't know about bats. We're really just scratching the surface and we're, we're continually discovering astonishing things. Bats are mammals with four limbs that evolved into wings. Bats are the only mammals that fly. Actually, apart from birds, they're the only vertebrates that fly. Bats live in deserts, forests, farmland, and cities. Scientists have identified about 1,400 species worldwide, which would make up 20% of Earth's mammalian diversity. But they believe there are more. Vampires are the most famous and can be found from Mexico to the tip of Argentina. Dr. Jerry Carter spends much of his time in the steamy jungles of Central America. I often think of vampire bats as kind of super bats. They have a whole range of abilities that other bats don't have. Vampire bats have complex social behaviors that we usually attribute to primates and marine mammals. You have unrelated individuals going out of their way to help each other. And this is something that's not that common in the animal world. And we think that vampire, these vampire bats have relationships that are in some way analogous to human friendships. Individuals invest in relationships that are reciprocal. And we think that they might avoid relationships where they are being exploited, or there's a sort of cheating going on. We think the bats respond to that. Bats are so secretive that even experts like Jerry Carter continue to be amazed. Vampire bats may even feed individuals outside their families, including pups. Female bats are very excellent mothers when it comes to the standards of most mammals. They make a really big investment in their offspring. These observations are hard won because almost all bats only emerge at night to hunt, regardless of what they eat. That's why most of us never see them. Most people don't come in contact with bats. There are some places where people eat bats, although this is probably not a good idea. So how could COVID-19 and other viruses find their way into human society from these elusive little creatures? Dr. Raina Plowright is a professor of epidemiology at Montana State University. We're still trying to understand the origins of the coronavirus pandemic. How a virus got from a bat into a human is a mystery at this point. It's possible that an intermediate host was necessary. We know that we have more contact with, with hosts that are not bats, so it's likely that there was an animal, say in a market, or even a wild setting that caught this virus from a bat, then allowed some genetic changes to occur and then transmitted the virus to a human. COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease. A zoonotic disease is a disease caused by a pathogen that is transmitted from an animal to a human. It's not that common that we actually get sick from, from animals. If you think about it, every time we walk outside, we're bombarded with microbes from, from trees, from soil, from our own cats, from our own dogs, from cows, from horses, but we actually rarely get sick. It's unlikely that the novel coronavirus, or SARS-CoV-2, spread directly from bats to humans. 
The, the best evidence suggests that the SARS-like viruses that are very close to SARS-CoV-2 came from horseshoe bats in the southern part of China, a region called Yunnan province. Whether it was an animal that was taken out of the wild or from a market and then transported to Wuhan, we don't know. And we don't know what animal might have served as the intermediate host before passing it to us. Civets were susceptible. We're finding out cats are actually susceptible. We know ferrets are susceptible. So what the, the ultimate host was, we don't know at this point in time. There are many options. Many believe that the intermediate host, whatever it might be, was part of the infamous wet market. There are three routes of transmission for zoonotic pathogens. One is through exposure to the excreted pathogen from an animal. So this could be for, to the urine or the feces, contamination of foodstuffs. Another is through the slaughter of animals and then contact with fluids or blood from the animal. And another is through vectors. So for example, a tick or a mosquito biting an animal and then biting a human. About 80% of viruses that exist are zoonotic viruses. And many are found in bats. We're trying to understand the viruses in bats. We're taking the virus, we're looking at its sequence, its sequence in its RNA, and then we're trying to predict from that sequence if that virus can infect a human. Because there are so many bat species, scientists must also investigate what they call spillover. Spillover happens when a virus that originates in a species begins to appear in other species. A spillover event is the passage of a pathogen from an animal to a human. This can be a distinct event that happens at one point in time, yet the consequences can be enormous. COVID-19, we have uh, millions of cases and hundreds of thousands of deaths, perhaps all linked to a single spillover event. By examining clues from different bat species, scientists inch closer to answers. I think the oldest recorded bat is 41 years old, which is really long for such a small animal. Um, bats are really outliers in terms of longevity. They are the longest lived mammals for their size. And there's actually quite a bit of research trying to understand why that is. A mouse might live a year, a horse might live 30 years. Well, bats live the same lifespan of a horse, maybe even longer. And we think that the long lifespan and their ability to fly is all tied up with their ability to host viruses. Researchers are also investigating the social dynamics within colonies. When healthy bats contract viruses, their strong immune systems can prevent them from getting sick or even having symptoms. We have some evidence that bats shed viruses when they are not healthy themselves. And so we're trying to find those biomarkers, indicators of bat health that then correlate to bats releasing viruses into the environment. A virus can be released through contact with an infected living bat, by contact with its fluids, or by touching a dead animal. The fact that bats are able to maintain these viruses at this very low level, so maybe dampen their replication, is really interesting and, and perhaps there'll be something there that will allow us to figure out how humans can control these viruses. It's possible that there are too many species of bats to pinpoint how they control viruses within their colonies. The other alternative explanation is that the reason we see so many viruses coming from groups of mammals like rodents and bats is simply because there are so many species of rodents and so many species of bats. Some viruses seem to be less lethal to bats than to other species. Once symptoms occur, rabies is almost always fatal in mammals. A colony of vampire bats will have a number of individuals that have built up an immunity to rabies. It's effectively like they've been vaccinated against rabies, much like you would vaccinate your cat or your dog. And so by randomly killing vampire bats, we're actually killing a lot of those individuals. And so the general take home message of this is that you cannot control a virus simply by killing bats. Reina's team is working around the clock 
trying to find ways to predict how and when bat-originated viruses might find their way to us. We have teams of bat ecologists, social scientists trying to understand how people and bats interact so that we can try to predict when spillover is going to happen. Because bats are such social creatures, changes in their colonies can put enormous stress on individuals. Both Jerry and Raina study bats in the field, where they're discovering the effects of stress on the creatures. We'll often sample bats and we won't find any virus. We'll find a very small amount of virus. Very few animals will be infected. And then we'll go back again and we'll suddenly find a lot of animals are infected. What we're trying to understand is why do we see these pulses of virus excretion from bats? And we're, we're starting to put together this evidence from long-term studies to show that we see these pulses of excretion when the bats are stressed. Still, few members of a colony may actually get sick, even when infected with a virus. One of the molecular mechanisms in bats' immune systems is the lightning-fast response of a signaling molecule called interferon alpha, which animals produce to prevent viruses from replicating. When interferon proteins are secreted by virus-infected cells, nearby cells go into a defensive antiviral state. Some parts of the immune system, for example, interferon alpha, have what we call constitutive expression so that they're always switched on. And the theory is then, if the animal's constantly exposed to viruses, its innate immune system is there ready to go, and so ready to suppress that virus instantly. The immune systems of other mammals aren't designed to counter most highly transmissible pathogens in the way that bats can. Bats are just like that that they're healthy when they have enough habitat to feed them, when everything is, the conditions are all good, these viruses are really dormant. But when the conditions are poor, when there's not enough food to eat and the bats become stressed, they start to excrete these viruses. Viruses can even increase their replication rate without killing their bat hosts. As far as we know, bats do not get sick from coronaviruses. We don't have a lot of studies but we have no evidence they do get sick. And this is very consistent with bats and the viruses we study, that they seem to be able to coexist with the viruses. They seem to be able to keep these viruses at a very low level and, uh, and not be overwhelmed by them. So why would bats have such unique immune systems? Bats have adapted to being infected with pathogens. They live in these huge populations. They have a lot of contact with each other. In some places, when they roost in, in trees, they're in a three-dimensional structure. So you have many bats over the top of other bats. So you can imagine that urination and defecation, they're constantly exposed to each other's pathogens. Perhaps because of that, they've developed these great defenses to stop these pathogens making them sick. Bats' immune systems also enable them to quickly repair any cellular damage caused by flight. They have DNA repair mechanisms that stop their cells from being damaged from flight and also stop them from going into senescence and getting old and dying soon. Bats do have a higher internal body temperature when they fly, and perhaps this is tied up with their ability to host infectious diseases. When they fly, bats' internal temperatures increase to around 104 degrees Fahrenheit, a temperature that kills most viruses. When bats fly to stay airborne, they have to increase their metabolic rate 16-fold, which is really extraordinary compared to what we can do as, as mammals or even other vertebrates. But at times, even robust bat colonies are more susceptible to viral outbreaks. We tend to see more virus at times of the year when the bats are more stressed, usually when there's less food available. Researchers still don't know all of the ways that viruses spread. Coronavirus uh, is, is different in that it survives outside the host. So coronavirus is likely to be excreted by bats or other species and then survive on, on the ground, on a surface, on food, and be transmitted by that route. 
rather than something as direct as a bite. Bats and humans have historically traded diseases back and forth. But these new outbreaks have become more common due to human behavior. And even though few of us will ever have direct contact with a bat, our worlds are increasingly overlapping. COVID-19 won't be the last pandemic, so it's critical that we now try to understand what are the conditions that initiated the spillover and then the transmission among people that led to the pandemic. Humans have created environments where there are high densities of animals, like wild animal farms and wet markets, places where zoonotic viruses can easily spread, and we're not protecting the places that bats need to stay healthy in the wild. Many people are unaware of the really important ecological roles that bats play, especially in the tropics, for pollinating plants, dispersing seeds of plants. If we want to prevent the next pandemic, we need to understand what caused this one. We're starting to understand that it's really driven by loss of habitat. In other systems, it might be driven by wildlife markets. But we need to do the research to put the factors together to really understand what are the conditions that allowed the pathogen to go from that animal to a human to spark the epidemic in the first place. Is there a solution? Scientists say we need to change the way we move through shared spaces on Earth. The bats depend on the forest for food. When those forests are taken away and the bats have no food, then their behavior changes. And that then brings them into contact with domestic animals and humans. While scientists and researchers try to piece together the complex interface between bats and humans, we should celebrate the tiny creatures for their extraordinary abilities and not fault them for our own transgressions. Bats are extremely important ecologically, and we should be doing everything we can to conserve their populations and to protect them. Maybe COVID-19 is the big jolt that we needed to see that our treatment of our ecosystems is going to ultimately affect us in a very severe way. We can't blame bats for just being exceptionally good at being themselves. We can't live without bats. They work so hard to do things that only benefit us. We have to protect bats. And we have to recognize that the reason these viruses are spilling out from bats into humans is because of our activities.